Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So today I wanted to do a video comparing comics and manga and how stories work and how stories don't work. But I realized in order to do that, I needed to talk about the art of storytelling first of all. And instead of making a hour long video covering the two, I'm going to separate it into two. Today I'm just going to talk about the art of storytelling. Because I'm pretty sure that everybody, no matter what side of the fence you're on, would agree that storytelling is an art. But here's the thing. When you talk about storytelling as an art, or you talk about any art at all, what are you doing? Well, you're employing rational and logical terms to your speech. Because art is a rational and logical term. But before I even get there, I want to step back and talk about why I'm always focusing on this sort of Aristotelian idea, how a story is told and how good stories are told particularly. It's because stories are based upon these rational ideas. Now, not all stories have to be, and historically there have been different kinds of stories, even within Europe, but certainly all over the world as well. There have been these many different ways of telling stories. But the thing is that none of them work as efficiently as reason does in order to tell their story. And this is why I would say that over the last couple of millennia, minimum, rational storytelling has simply won out over all these other forms of storytelling. And this is why we have a form of storytelling today that is rational and logical at its base, and why we use Aristotle all the time to talk about the structure of a good story, even though he discussed that structure 2400 years ago. It's not just inertia, it's not just cultural, it's the fact that the rational form of storytelling is the most efficient way of storytelling. And one of the secondary things that I want to prove today with what I'm going to talk about is that exact point that rational storytelling is the most efficient way of storytelling. So let's start there. Let's start with reason itself. Well, what is reason itself? So if you want me to give you a strict, logical, and rational definition of it, it is the act of the mind which links or separates the conclusions, subject, and predicate through the middle term. Now, that's probably not making a whole lot of sense to you right now, but give me a few minutes and it will make perfect sense. But to speak in more layman's terms, what rationality is, it's a process by which we come to know things. Because we know that human beings know things through a step-by-step -step process. Because when you see something, you automatically don't know everything about it. You have to learn about it. And that learning process is a process. It's a step-by-step -step process. And reasoning is a very specific version of this step-by-step -step process. It's the step-by-step -step process, which involves a subject and a predicate. And I want to get to that, but I'm going to put it aside just for a moment. Right now, I want to focus on how reason connects to art. Because what is the rational definition of what art is? Well, art is the ability of your mind to understand the step-by-step -step process and the rules under which that step-by-step -step process works in order to achieve a specific end. So if your specific end is to paint a painting, you should know the step-by-step -step process whereby and how you are going to paint this picture. You know what paint to use, you know what canvas to use, you know what brush strokes to use, you know all of these step-by-step -step things and the rules under which they are governed in order to get your desired end of the finished picture. But we're not talking about pictures here, we're talking about storytelling. So what is the desired end of the art of storytelling? Well, Aristotle would say that the desired end of the art of storytelling is to have a representation, a representation of reality. Now, does he just pull this out of his hat, or is this just something that is cultural or specific to his thought? Well, no it isn't. Because if we look at a story, how is a story constructed? Well, a story is constructed in using signs. Now, I typically talk about comics. When we're talking about comics, we're talking about a medium that uses two different kinds of signs at once. It uses a visual sign and it uses language as a sign. So there are two different kinds of signs that make up the story. And a sign itself is a representation of reality. Signs are not reality themselves. And what they do is they connect this representation to the thing itself within the mind of the person they are presenting this sign to. So stories in using signs, which they naturally have to do in order to be told, are representations of reality. 
And very briefly, there are two different kinds of signs that can be used. There is logically what is known as a natural sign and logically what is known as an artificial sign. Your natural sign is a sign that has a real connection between it and the intended meaning which it is trying to convey. But an artificial sign has that connection which is only established through some human institution, like culture. And to give you some brief examples of this, I'll use a couple of language signs. If you said something was red hot, most people understand what you're talking about when you say red hot. Because red equals hot in the minds of most people, because naturally, when things get hot, they tend to turn red. So if you took that phrase, red hot, and you translated it into a different language and gave it to a people who know nothing about our culture, they would still understand that red equals hot and why it does so, because there's a natural connection between those two things. Therefore, red is a natural sign for hot. But if I was to use the phrase, it is raining cats and dogs, the only reason why in your mind the image of dogs and cats falling out of the sky equates it is raining very hard is because of our language and because of our culture. If you took those words and translated them again into another language, word for word, and gave them to people who knew nothing about our culture, it would make zero sense to them. Because the only thing connecting the image of cats and dogs falling from the sky and it raining very hard is a cultural connection. Therefore, it is an artificial sign. But I am again going to take natural sign and artificial sign and set those aside just for a minute and go back to reasoning itself and go back to storytelling as a reasoning vehicle. Now, what I'm about to say may sound very boring, but once I get to the end, you'll see the profound connection it has with storytelling. If you look at reasoning itself and that definition which I gave you at the first of this video, what is the basic form of reasoning? Well, basically, just to use common terms, you take three sentences, each of which have a subject and a predicate, and you use them to move from something that is known to something that is unknown. So each of these sentences has a subject and a predicate. A subject is the thing in which the predicate is acting upon, and the predicate is the action which modifies your subject. So I'm reading a very good Flash story right now called Flash Forward. So I'm going to use Wally West as my example, just because he's on the top of my mind. So we have three sentences, and the first sentence goes like this. Man is corruptible. Second sentence goes like this. But Wally West is a man. Third sentence goes like this. Therefore, Wally West is corruptible. So, to break it down, within your first sentence, man is the subject, and your predicate is, is corruptible. In your second sentence, Wally West is your subject, and your predicate is, is a man. In your third sentence, Wally West is the subject, and your predicate is, is corruptible. So the first sentence is what is known as the major term, the middle sentence is known as the middle term, and the last sentence is known as the minor term. And what we are doing here, the basic form of what we are doing here, is you take the predicate from the first sentence, and you take the subject from the second sentence, and you add them together in the third sentence. So with the third sentence, your subject is the subject from the second sentence, and your predicate is the predicate from the first sentence. So what you're doing is you're combining those two sentences to make a new sentence, which will connect those different subjects and predicates from the first and the second sentence. And in so doing, in creating that third sentence, you are either affirming something that you already know, or you are revealing something that you did not know previously. And the thing is, this simple little mechanism that I have just described for you is the basic structure of a story. Because you have a story, and a story consists of three different things. Number one, your character or characters. Number two, the plot. And number three, again, for ease sake, I will call it the form in which your story is told. Now, if we look specifically at your characters and your plot, well, what are they? Well, your character is your subject, and your plot is your predicate. And I would say, the major reason why you have all of these stories, which are three act stories, is because they're rational. So act one is your major term. Act two is your middle term. Act three, your conclusion, is your minor term. So in act one, your subject is your characters and your predicate is your plot. 
and what you focus on in Act 1 is your plot. And in Act 2, you have a slightly different view of your subject, which are your characters, and again you have a modification of your predicate, which is your plot. And in Act 3, your conclusion, you take that predicate or that plot from Act 1 and you combine it with your characters from Act 2, which are your subject, into the conclusion whereby you either affirm within the reader's mind that which they already know, or you reveal something that they did not know previously. This itself is the art of storytelling because you understand the step-by-step -step process and the rules which govern this step-by-step -step process, this rational process whereby you get to reveal something or confirm something that you already know. And this is how a story is told, the most efficient way a story can be told. But to get back to those few things that I set aside previously, I said there's not just your characters and your plot, but there's also the form of your storytelling. Now let's talk for a second about that form of storytelling. It goes back to what I was talking about at the first. Your story is a representation of reality because it uses signs. And signs are divided into natural signs and artificial signs. But signs themselves, and this distinction between natural and artificial, is an accident. Logically, that's what it's called. It's an accident. And it is also logically called a quality. And quality is one of the 10 categories or classifications under which all material things can be placed. And it affects how your predicate in your argumentation of your story is actually expressed. Now, to be thorough, I'll list those 10 categories very briefly, just to show you how these things would connect to storytelling. Number one is substance. Number two is quality. Number three is quantity. Number four is relation. Number five is action. Number six is passion. Number seven is where. Number eight is position. Number nine is when. Number 10 is possession. But again, of those 10 categories, we need to focus on quality because most typically signs go under this category of quality. And we want to focus on them because the quality of your argument is a way of predicating. Therefore, it affects your predicate, which is your plot for your story, which in turn affects your subject, which is the characters of your story. So you have to have, in effect, a good quality story. That is to say, the form of your story needs to have good quality. Because your quality affects how your predicate and your subject interact. And if your quality is deficient, the form of your story is deficient, it will overlay that deficiency onto your predicate, your plot, and onto your subject, your characters, and malform them in such a way that your reader cannot understand what is going on. That is to say, they cannot rationally see the connection between the subject and the predicate in the different acts in order to understand the conclusion. Now, I hope that I can cover in my next video the difference between a natural sign and an artificial sign within the story itself, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about a natural sign and an artificial sign that govern the form of the story itself, not within the story. And the thing is that in order to have good quality, you need to have a natural sign. You can't use an artificial sign. However, I'll have to put one little caveat in there. If your artificial sign is in the same category as your natural sign, then you can fudge it a little bit to use an artificial sign, but only because that artificial sign really is just a step away in the same category from your natural sign. So it has to have reference to that natural sign in another step. But even when you take that into consideration, what you have to have to have a good quality story is to have the form of your signs being used to be natural. And again, you can use natural and artificial signs within the story itself, and I would say you need a mix of the two, but we're talking about the form, the larger form of storytelling as overlays your plot and your characters. And as such, that sign needs to be natural. And why? Because an artificial sign does not generate a rational argument. And what you're doing with your story is you're mimicking a rational argument. And therefore, if you're not using a natural sign, then you're not having an actual rational argument, again, as I said, and your readers cannot understand what is going on either within the story or within the conclusion. And here's where I want to bring it all the way back to comics. And I would say most mediums of storytelling right now, whether it be movies or television or novels or anything else that is being put out in Western society as a story in the mainstream, all of these stories 
are based upon a progressive ideology, are based upon a progressive notion, the idea of the world itself that underlays everything within your story is that progressivism is true. And the thing is that progressivism in itself is an artificial sign. Absolutely and completely it is an artificial sign. Now, I'm not going to go into that today, but if someone wants me to make an entire video about that, I can do that as well. Let me know in the comments if you want me to do a video like that. But to go over it very briefly here is what I've been saying in a number of my videos. Within your progressive ideology, there is no such thing as a natural sign. Everything, and I do mean everything under their ideology, including reality itself, is a social construct to these people. And if everything is a social construct, and a social construct is an artificial sign, then everything is an artificial sign. And the only thing that they can use to tell their story is an artificial sign. And this is why their stories fail over and over and over again. Because as much as they hate logic and hate reason, they are using the structures of logic and reason in order to tell a story, in order to express their art of storytelling. They are using those mechanisms that have proven to be the easiest way to tell a story. But at the heart, the form of the story is an artificial sign, which is progressivism. And when you have an artificial sign as opposed to a natural sign, which is controlling the form of your story, and an artificial sign that controls that form is actually going to, in every case, malform the reasoned argument within it and make it something that is not actually rational. Therefore, their stories do not actually convey the meaning that they want to convey. And they fall apart because the relation of their characters to their plot, their subject to their predicate, is being controlled by this artificial sign, and this artificial sign will not allow that rational argumentation within the story itself to proceed in a way that is going to have a correct result. The correct result, again, is being that those signs become a representation of reality, and that representation of reality is understood by the reader. The only people that actually, quote unquote, understand their story are people who share their similar progressive mindset. That is to say, they are people who understand the artificial sign upon which they are building this story. But even then, they have to be people who understand the rationality behind storytelling itself without possessing the ability to take that rationality and apply it to progressivism itself, which is the form of the story. Because if they did, if you take rationality and you apply it to progressivism and the idea that there is no such thing as a natural sign, progressivism falls apart because it does not connect to reality. So you have this tiny little minority of people that understand this artificial sign of progressivism and understand the rational argumentation within a story and how it is told, but will simply not take that rational understanding and apply it to progressivism itself. So they not only accept this progressive artificial sign, but they have to at the same time put blinders on so they can't see what is just outside of their vision. And they have to purposefully not look at that. And this is the tiny minority of people which, again, can quote unquote, understand what is going on within these stories. The rest of us can't understand what is going on within these stories because it's not rational. And we are used to rational storytelling because the rational way of storytelling is the easiest way to tell a story, to be a representation of reality, and has won out over all of these other forms of storytelling over the last several millennia. But the beauty of all this is the fact that all I have just said sounds terribly complicated. But it's just a way of expressing it so that we can understand it and connect these ideas together one with another. Most people really understand most of this stuff simply through common sense. They might not know how to express it, but they know it's a bad story when it's a bad story. And they know it's a bad story because these things don't connect together. And they're using their reason. And they're making distinctions between natural signs and artificial signs and which ones are connected to reality and which ones aren't. Because again, we live in societies, especially in Western society, where rationality is drilled into you as being the simplest way to understand things. So to express everything that I've just talked about in a very colloquial way, I would say that progressive storytelling in all of its forms is simply going to fail. Why? Because the form of their storytelling is deficient at its basis. And the majority of people 
can see and understand that it is deficient by engaging their common sense. And the most natural way, I think, this would be expressed in the minds of the majority, in the minds of the people who use their common sense, is that this progressive storytelling is simply bad art. So, if I've given you anything new to think about, hit like. Hit the shield in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to subscribe and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think about all this. And, by the way, if anybody wants to point out any deficiencies in my logic at all, you go right ahead. You would be doing me a service if you did so. All right. I'll see you later. Bye.